You're listening to the Bulk Loads Podcast, your number one resource into everything bulk freight trucking. And this is episode 225. Hey guys, Jared Flynn with the Bulk Loads Podcast. Got Tyler with me here. What's going on? Our audience is in for a treat. Oh yeah. This podcast is going to blow up in my opinion. Yeah. This is awesome. You're probably listening on the side being like, what is he talking about? Um, before we get to that, the tip that we want to give, Tyler, I'll let you key this one up. Yeah. Um, so what we want to kind of go over for the tip this week um, is a couple of different items. Um, but kind of the first thing we want to mention, as we mentioned in our last episode, is we do have the Bulk Loads Conference, um, the first ever Bulk Loads Conference coming up in February of 2023. Um, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear, first off, what you guys would like to talk about at this conference, um, our, our main um, idea for this conference is to bring the industry problems and what solutions we can come up with uh, to help better the industry for you guys um, as truck drivers, owner operators, brokers, shippers, all the above, which I think flows right into this podcast um, yeah. because we bring on Dr. Michael Belzer. Um, he, he talks about regulation and he goes into the history of trucking as well as uh, some of the problems we're facing today in it. Yeah. I'll back up to that podcast again for you listening. It's a, it's going to be a two day event. You'll come in the night before um, we'll have some kind of social activity, but then that next day it'll be just kind of a full day of events. Um, we'll have some panel discussions, uh, a speaker, a couple more panel discussions, and then we'll have a, a, a social activity involved, um, which we have a good idea, but yeah, we'd love to have you come. We'd love to meet you face to face. We have thousands of members um, of our community. A lot I've never met and would love to meet. I'm a, I'm a face-to-face type person, old yep. school type. So we really love to see you there. Today, we're going to bring on Michael Belzer. We found out about Michael. He's a professor up in Michigan, but he had a little, I guess, um, segment on this YouTube uh, video that went out talking about the problems in trucking. And um, I welcome you to go check out that YouTube link. What was it called? Was it like the the issues in trucking? Yeah, the and I'll post a link in the in the show. Yeah, notes it was. I mean, it on. was wild. But um, Michael was actually a driver before, and then went to graduate school, became a professor. He actually wrote this book titled "Sweat Shops on Wheels: The Winners and Losers in Trucking Deregulation." I have learned so much about deregulation, but there was a lot I never knew and really the whys. So I reached out to Michael. He graciously said that he'd come on and man, we got to talking. There's so much to cover. I'm not even going to give the highlights, but what I wanted for him to do is to take us back in time to the very beginning part of trucking. And I'm talking like stagecoach, yeah. like horses and buggies trucking to the trucks that we have today on the road and that journey uh, that we've come across. And I'm telling you, you will find this so fascinating. If you love trucking, you're passionate like me, like you're going to love this. We actually recorded an hour and 30 minutes, the longest podcast episode yep. I've ever done. So we're going to splice this in half. We're going to do the first half this week and then the second half next week. And you'll hear a little on our outro, uh, but just want to prepare you for that because um, this thing, it's just a lot to pack in one, but you're going to get so much out of this. I know you will. So with that said, here's my conversation with Michael Belzer. Hey, Michael, thanks for uh, coming on. Good to be here. Yeah. Well, we've had a couple conversations before. Um, I found about I found out about you. Um, it was through, um, uh, I think it was a Cheddar article, but really talked about kind of why trucking is where it is today. And you were so gracious to come on, but this is like, I think it's a little, almost like a hidden or almost a secret. People don't realize kind of why we are where we are today with trucking. Um, and especially professionals that are in the industry, just wondering, um, I'm going to let you talk, but I want to kind of paint the stage a little bit. You know, I've been doing this now for, I mean, going on 18 years when I first kind of got into trucking and I always heard, you know, some of the older truckers, I was going to say old timers, but they say, you know, it isn't like it used to be and it's changed so much. And, 
you know, and people talked about deregulation and, you know, deregulation ruined trucking. Um, so I want to throw that out there. And I mean, we're going to go several different ways with this conversation, but let's jump into that. I mean, from your perspective, why are we, why are we at where we are today? Well, the whole purpose of the movement to deregulation was to put more competition in the market. And by putting more competition in the market, uh, reduce the cost and increase the efficiency of the supply chain. So the whole point was, in fact, to reduce cost. And uh, if you feel like you're not making any money, but you're working harder than ever, then you have a good idea about what's really going on and deregulation in that sense was successful. The whole point of creating that intensely competitive environment is to eliminate economic profits. Now, nobody likes to live in a world where their economic profits are eliminated, but that's what people do. And that's the goal of the, the movement to deregulate the economy generally, to make everything dependent on a market price that is driven by the most intense competition possible. The trouble is you buy fuel in a market that's not exactly competitive because there's just a handful of oil companies. And it's not exactly competitive because it's prices controlled by the OPEC oil cartel. There's a whole bunch of factors out there that actually aren't competitive. And yet, if you're in trucking, you're living under the the shadow of this intention to drive down cost of uh, transportation, freight transportation, and passenger transportation, I would add, by uh, making it more competitive. And more competitive simply means um, you have to scrap harder to make any money. And if the uh, market is working super well, you won't be making any money. You'll just be working. That's not exactly what you signed up for. And I think that's one of the things that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Business school teaches you all kinds of things about how you make money, but they don't teach you the economics that essentially says competition is designed to make sure that you make only the basic amount of money you got to make to replicate your labor, to replicate your capital, and to pay for the value of the, the capitalization you've put in. And that turns out not to be very much money when it really comes down to it. And that's what we're experiencing uh, today at this point in this highly competitive environment. So let's turn back a little bit and talk about the ICC and kind of how that started and why it was started. And because I, I love what you told me before. I mean, this goes back to the to the railroads. I mean, you were talking about even horse and buggies transporting goods. But like, talk about what like the very beginning of really as as we know transportation. Well, that's where you go back to the horse without a buggy. Yeah, that's where true. Where you go back, or you go back to that Stone Age guy that they found frozen up in the Alps carrying everything on his back. <laughs> so. Uh, I once read a neat book. I reviewed a book, actually, about uh, the history of a particular company hauling freight from London to the to the southwest of of England, and uh, they started on around 900. I think they had the records. They got the historian had the records all the way back. So it was it was pack horses. It was people carrying stuff. Eventually got to be horse and buggy and then it became the wagons and when they were really when they were really flat out successful in the mid 1800s they were called flying wagons because they were really big wagons about two tons and uh and those really big wagons pulled by a big team of horses who were driven of course by teamsters driving teams <laughs> and they uh, that team wrote, drove those. That team went 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the blinding speed of a mile and a half an hour, approximately. 
And uh, it was an insane job and uh, a lot of drinking and fighting because, you know, it's a rough job and it attracted rough, a rough uh, workforce and tough workforce to handle the horses and the teams at that, especially at that blinding speed. So um, these wagons were, you know, would we would think, look at them and say, well, they're really big. They had really big wheels on them, all that stuff called Russell's flying wagons. And it was a real big business. And it got knocked out by this thing that we know called the iron horse. It goes to the railroads in the mid 19th century. Yeah. So that's why the story is such an interesting story and goes for, I don't know, as I remember off the top of my head, 900 years. Uh, they, they found the records in chant. The, the histor historians do this crazy stuff. Found the records at some chancery court in London someplace you know, we're blowing off the dust is, is, a, is the least of your problems. Having the records not crumble in your hands is the other problem. But that's the history of, of transport. And it was always tough, always competitive, and um, and for a long time, very unregulated, right? Because mainly you tried to keep them from, from killing each other, these, these roused about Teamsters. But when the railroad came along, it presented this tremendous competition. They were going like 10 or 20 miles an hour. So, I mean, I don't have the numbers anymore, but they were going at a blind, really blinding rate of speed. It's, think about it, how we do this today. We, what is blinding rate of speed to our fathers or grandfathers or great grandfathers is today really slow, right? It's sort of like the internet. When the railroads came along, that kind of knocked out Russell's flying wagons and it made it really difficult. And in fact, it was a long, long time before road transportation, road meaning surface of the ground, uh, came back again. And we're kind of living in that era, right? But in the United States, there were no roads. The roads were, were called corduroy roads. They were really rugged. And literally, they, they cut trees down, split them in half, or put them down on the, and you bump, bump, bump down the road. And let's just say the, the seats weren't exactly Bostrom cushion air seats, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 it took a lot of idea, and I'm sure you lived to a ripe old age of 35. When the railroads came along in the U.S., and it really wasn't until the late 19th century, really, 18, 18, I mean, the Civil War was won by the North in part because it had a better railroad system. And in fact, because the Southerner, the Southern Democrats had seceded from the Union, finally the, the, the industrial builders that really dominated what was the new Republican Party came out of the Whig Party. Uh, that group was the one that built the Transcontinental Railroad. These are things, investments that uh, the Southern Democrats just would, would always block. So that's when things started to really take off. And that transportation was crucial in keeping the union together. And going into the 1870s, now we're talking about some pretty big enterprises. Uh, yeah, a little bit earlier than that was canals. I don't want to get off into canals, but canals were like that. That was what in the early 1800s, uh, for about 15 years or so, maybe, that's the point. That's where they thought where all the transportation money was going to be because they were moving really, really fast on those canals, almost as fast as a horse could walk, pack horse. Hmm. So everything started to change a lot when the iron horse came along and the railroads came along. And the problem was uh, a lot of people, some people were making money. This was really good for opening up markets just like with highways, how you open up markets. So railroads opened up markets and they were an extraordinary thing because for the first time you had a market that was not on water. You could actually have people producing stuff and selling stuff and didn't have to rely on waterborne transportation. So if you think about what it took to get stuff down the Mississippi or the Missouri, you know, then you go to some other rivers, it's a lot harder and harder Pretty quickly, you start running out with running out of water depth, and so those places couldn't be farmed because they didn't have water. Now the railroad comes along, and that technology, which is the 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 
Silicon Valley IT emergent uh, uh, sector of the 19th century, exploded and transformed the entire North American economy, the United States economy, and made possible the spread of transportation uh, of freight widely. So all those farms in North, North Dakota and those farms in different places around parts of the country that didn't get served by deep enough water, suddenly they had transportation. They could grow wheat. They could grow other commodities and send them back to the big cities. And wow, was this a big thing. And then, because the railroad didn't depend on the water routes, it could cross over between where two rivers maybe went north and south. Well, the railroad could just cut the whole thing short and take a month out of the transportation. Well, this is really a big deal. So think of how explosive that had to be at the time. I always like to put myself in other people's shoes because you got to recognize how explosive was that growth that resulted. That's where the origin of the Industrial Revolution in the United States comes from, and it really comes out of transportation. Economics focused so more on transportation than anything else. I, I once, a colleague of mine, a buddy of mine at the University of Michigan, uh, who was in their economics department uh, some years ago, uh, when he realized what I was doing and we started working together on stuff, he said, do you realize I've been looking into the University of Michigan's economics department in the early 1900s, and it was just full of transportation economists. That's what they were doing, just trying to figure out this stuff. Well, the very technological power that gave such economic liberation to market forces also became a weapon, as it tends to do. And people who had control of the railroads wanted to use that to control the commodities, control your access, control, you know, they had kind of a stranglehold on transportation. Only if there are railroads competing near each other, which is kind of an expensive proposition, uh, which is why so many booms and busts occurred during that time, or part of the reason, could you have competition among railroads that would successfully drive down the transportation costs so you, the farmer, could get access to the market. So in 1877, this is coming off the top of my head, in 1877, the um, Interstate Commerce Act was passed and the Interstate Commerce Commission was created as a as a uh, an, uh, an agency and ex as that was an extension of Congress, not the executive branch, but the legislative branch, which, by the way, will be an important factor looking 100 years later. So they were made responsible for doing this and for regulating this thing because you had monopolies growing, you had the Gilded Age and all this greedy stuff and the, the the there were revolutions out on the plains, you know. One of the one of the hotbeds of socialism was Arkansas and Kansas, and uh, and the piney woods in Texas. And I bet you didn't think about it that way. So, mm -mm. but that that was insane. It was really, really, really intense all the way through and into the 1900s. And that's where the fight over the gold standard with the the silver standard was. The Eastern bankers wanted the gold standard and the Westerners wanted the silver standard because there was more silver. It was like uh, providing more currency so they could expand. Whereas the people who had all the money in Boston and New York, they wanted to hold on to it all. The people out West wanted access. And there were political movements and strikes and activity all throughout that region. And, and, it is in that context after a giant national railroad strike that the Interstate Commerce Commission was created. And that was to make sure that producers had access to transportation to get their products to market. Not a bad thought, right? So you asked for it, you just got it. The entire, in a nutshell, the historical exposition of where, where this all came from. And when uh, what they did at the time, as we discussed earlier, what they did at the time was try to regulate your access to transportation. That's one of the things that was really important. And to try to make sure that you didn't have too many people competing uh, for access 
so that it drove price down into the ground. So somewhere in there, there had to be a balance and their job was to figure out how to do that. Their methods were methods that we today wouldn't take up because we understand economics differently than they did back then. It was a really a long time ago. Economics is really a pretty new social science. So they didn't really understand all that stuff, but they tried at least to do the best they could to contain the competition so that the transportation would be, be proper. And one of the things that they did was create the notion of the common carrier. And the common carrier was, uh, uh, was 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 a status that that required you to haul products if people in that area wanted their products hauled you had to haul them you were kind of like a kind of like a utility um we everybody needs access to power everybody needed access to transportation and it was a very scarce uh service to get access to so when you, so when you mentioned the to try to make sure that could happen when you mentioned the like the first common carrier are you referring to the railroads? Or are you actually referring to kind of, as we know, like the first? Okay, I'll let you finish. No, you got it right. I'm I'm jumping. I'm hearing you. That was what they created that notion for railroads. You are, you, we count on the economy and the expansion of the United States economically depends on those railroads and that transportation. So they were regulated to make sure everybody got access to it. Okay at a reasonable price and that nobody cheated. So very infamously late in the 19th century, John D. Rockefeller uh, got everybody mad at him. It was a common thing. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt considered him a really bad guy. Um, and John D. Rockefeller famously, uh, essentially paid kickbacks to uh, uh, railroads that would carry his oil and because he had Standard Oil, which was a monopoly uh, throughout the entire United States, it was, it was an enormous monopoly of oil. And he made sure that he could maintain his monopoly by kicking back to the railroad folks um, a, uh, a, a kickback to haul his freight and to put up barriers to hauling other people's oil. So that's how you really get rich, right? And he did. And that's what was what created that's one of the driving forces that's kind of that story is a good example but that drove creation of the sherman antitrust act in the 1890s which is to prevent the actions that block competition to from taking place so competition good competition bad it's kind of this continuous push-pull struggle i'm loving this so, so keep walking us through this journey. You have the railroads and then you get into the, the early 1900s. And now we're getting into to vehicles, our, you know, our first automobiles. Explain to how this transitioned into non-railroad freight being moved. I mean, this is a good one. This is a good one. So it starts road transportation because of the nature of roads which were really beyond primitive at that time and were very, really local because they were so primitive. They made it most of what wagon teams did, in spite of what you may have seen in mythology on TV, most of what wagon teams did was haul its drayage, which we know now, we know what that term means. Mm -hmm. So they hauled freight from um, a river port or a seaport uh, or a rail railhead uh, or rail terminal to uh, where it was going to be used. But by the nature of the roads, you can see they didn't haul it all that far because they couldn't. Yeah. And and if you've been kind of paying attention, it's interesting living in, in southeast Michigan. I'm really, really aware of how many railroads there have been. I mean, I live right really within less than a hundred yards of, of a railroad that was on the that that is on the oldest map of Ann Arbor, Michigan, done by balloon in the 1870s. And that railroad still follows the same route it always has, and it runs right by my house. A lot of a lot of um transportation freaks who think that we should have 
we should put passenger trains on the railroad and all that. Don't understand. That's a private road. That's what a railroad is. And um, so it is something that's built, speculated to be built and built and maintained by a private company and has been, and the whole country was crisscrossed by all these old railroads going this way or that because there were no roadways, street roads at the time. So that's why there's so many of them. It became more pretty, pretty, it kind of became obsolete as the highway system was built. But in, in the mid 1890s was when the Teamsters Union was first formed. Oh, wow. It is, they're representing team drivers. It was called the Team Drivers Union, right? So, because they were driving wagons. And, um, and they pretty much were local. It was never understood, certainly at the time, it was inconceivable that people would go farther than that short distance you would go with that wagon pulling the freight. No matter how big your team was, it wasn't going to go all that fast. Horsepower was sort of like torque with your diesel. It was enough to get you up the hill if you had enough a big enough team, but they were still only going to go so fast. Um, so these first the Teamsters, I, I assume these are, yeah. you know, more New York, Chicago, big cities, right, big cities running freight out of there. Right. And so they tended to move freight among the in, new industrial uh, factories and what have you, and raw materials and all the other stuff. But raw materials are pretty much has, you'd find that all the old factories are on some kind of a river somewhere because anything of any size was just not going to be uh, in bulk, which wasn't going to be on uh, a roadway, let alone a railroad even. I mean, they could go on a railroad, but they couldn't go on on streets. It would just be just too intensive. So they, they were really just limited by the scale of of uh, the technology of the time. So these first and, these first Teamsters well, that we yeah. that you mentioned, yeah, did they have to follow the same rules of formed by the ICC? Was it the same? Good question. The answer is no. So that that there because this was just a local business. And because there's always somebody else who will show up to haul your freight, that's the, the, you notice that that hasn't changed, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so they, they always just, they pop up and then they get busted out as the market shifts and, oh, well, here we go again. That same deja vu all over again has been happening for a long time. The railroads have a big capitalization. I mean, the capital that it takes to build a railroad is intense. So that's why you have you have operation operating ratios in the 50s or 60s maybe. Um, I don't even I don't keep up on it, but today, you know, your operating ratios have to be really low because you have such capitalization. It's it's just a big expensive thing to build. Trucks not so much, not so hard. Yeah. So they have a low operating or they have that high operating ratio, low margin. Yep. That's the nature of that beast. But um at the turn of the last century, uh, it was truly railroads driving this, this, this story, railroads and water transportation, seaports and water ports, and, uh, and, and all the teamsters, the wagon drivers, would be doing all the work that had to be done around all that activity. Um, and, and the capitalization required to get into it, just like today, relatively speaking, it's low. Mm -hmm. So they could get into it. And there were a lot of owner operators. So as I, I may have mentioned to you before, waving my hands here for dates, but 1900, uh, you essentially had this kind of uh, few big cities that had um, Teamsters and had that activity. And uh, and they were just doing local work, and uh, about not half and half, sixty forty something like that, were employees to owner operators. And in different cities, you you just had a culture where they were all owner operators. Some they were employees. Some were struggling back and forth. A lot of a lot of a lot of 
when we say we had a, a competitive fight, it was a bit of a competitive gang fight over that, you know, uh, who was going to be in control. Uh, and 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 in my, I'm not a historian, but in my understanding, teamster teamsters were perhaps strongest in Boston and in Chicago. And uh, one was a, uh, I think I think Chicago was employees and Boston was owner. Operators, and I say owner operators, I mean guys who owned their wagon and their team. So um, they, but that varied. It depended on where you were, and they were all over the place. Because that's the only way stuff got moved, other than the railroad, right? So um, that created that meant that the origin of origin of the Teamsters as a union was a combination of owner operators and uh and employed team drivers and and it depended on where you were what the circumstances were how where that balance was but it was understood that both were all doing the same work and were all in the same competitive environment and had to be treated the same and insisted to be on being treated the same and so that was an important foundation. And it wasn't until 1970 that owner operators, uh, the federal courts intervened and decided to write their own rules and, and wrote the owner operators out. Up until that point, the Teamsters Union represented most owner operators. Hmm. If any of your listeners remember Roadway Express, yeah. uh, Roadway Express was a dominated, was all the over the road guys. Were, were owner operators. And uh, all the intercity roadway drivers were owner operators until uh, mid 1950s. There was a, a fight between two brothers who ran the company and one who wanted to control everything more by having everybody em being employees, uh, one out and the other guy went away. I can imagine Thanksgiving was not a pleasant sight in the uh, and their family. But that's the way it goes, you know, when brothers fight. But um, the idea that anything was any one structure by nature, this is the way things are, crazy. Not just didn't happen. It, it depended on the circumstances and what the trucking owner wanted, the trucking company folks wanted. If you want to watch a great movie, a great B movie. It's called They Drive by Night. One of my favorites. It's about 1934. And the star is George Raft. And the new new guy on the block uh, was the rough and tumble, ugly guy playing the owner operator. Uh, that guy's named Humphrey Bogart. Mm. And you don't know George Raft, but he was the star. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart was the kind of scrapper the new scrapper up up and coming actor but it's a great story it's based in california and the company i always thought the company that george raft worked for he was like the union steward uh was the responsible company and i always thought of it as consolidated freightways it's a mythical company but it all you you probably don't even Consolidated Freight Ways oh, yeah. went out of business about the time you got into the business, right? Yeah. So I remember the name. Though. I remember them very, very well. Uh, so I want to interview go, them extensively just before they went under. You talk kind of getting up to the 1970s, but like, if you don't mind, walk through, you know, we have this, you know, the, the, the original teams, you know, horse and these huge buggies. We get into the automobiles, um, these owner operators. Um, and you said, I mean, primarily into the 1970s, it was primarily owner operators. Um, th so there weren't any large, you know, 50 plus 100 truck operations during that period or. No, no, there were. There were consolidated freightways as one of them. They were a lot smaller than these companies are today because. Keep in mind that there was no national highway system uh, until early 1920s and that was a very rudimentary system that was dirt roads mud roads log roads all kinds of crazy stuff up until world war one nobody gave 
gave the time of day to the idea that um what do you call them horseless buggies that those cars could do anything more than be terrorizing reasonable people going at a reasonable rate of speed on a horse or uh, otherwise running over people on the streets so it was it was kind of a novelty uh and it wasn't used for freight in any way really during world war 1 in Europe, that's when using motor vehicles in a battlefield or back and forth around a battlefield, for the first time, that became a real thing. And it was kind of a came up with this realization in, 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 in time of war, what these things could be used for. So it's just like figuring out what your computer can be used for. You know, it takes time. New technology comes online, and then it takes sometimes decades to figure out what it's really good for. So, after World War One, is the first beginnings of this uh, roadways uh, using the roadway as transportation. And in fact, yellow, yellow freight mm -hmm. has its origins as a taxi company in St. Louis, and uh, and they threw stuff. If somebody wanted a taxi ride, there was kind of, okay, well, the trunk is empty. I can go the, on the taxi on the road and go to some city, maybe even to Kansas City. That's a wild trip. You can just imagine that. But throw stuff in the trunk. And it started doing that. And eventually they started making up the roads or making up the, these, these vehicles more like trucks. And it was, uh, you know, the evolution kind of started moving fairly quickly. Uh, like that and that went all the way through the 30s as those companies expanded but remember they're still almost entirely doing local work because most of the freight's still being moved the same way i told you before so but there's the beginnings of this if an express i i i've read stories about the chain drive mac and the five-day trip from new york to chicago and that was an incredible trip in a chain drive mac so um and and brutal nothing nothing cushy like what we ride in today so um uh but that was a thing you would do maybe for express reasons for things like that it's only for maybe high valued commodities where you really needed to move you, which is a logic you can understand in the brokering business you have to understand that basic concept time is money as that's essential to your understanding of what you're going to choose to sell, services you're going to do, all the rest of that stuff. And, and that same thing at the time was going on, but the roadways were just really, really rudimentary. And during the 1920s, uh, there was a rapid growth of more intercity road freight transportation until by the 1930s, it was getting pretty widespread or, or still rudimentary, but, but pretty widespread, relatively speaking. It's beginning to happen. And the roads are beginning to get improved now that we have this U.S. highway system. The National Road, U.S. 40, U.S. 66, the beginnings of these highways are being linked together and, and, and established at that point. In fact, in fact, the I, I participate pretty heavily in the trans or have over the years in the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies, and its origins are as the Highway Research Board, which is a bunch of transportation uh, highway local transportation highway people talking to other highway transportation people trying to figure out how to do this because everybody at this point is pushing the envelope economically while they're trying to figure out how to respond to this technological. Uh, change and the way things are being done for the first time in a way they'd never been done before going between cities in a motor vehicle so that was a really big big shift and to go back to they drive by night through the 1920s and into the 1930s these same local highway officials became very concerned about how dangerous this transportation was how un completely unregulated it was it was insane and they worked for nothing. So the drive by night story is essentially uh, in one movie, the, 
macrocosm drawn close and you have these two leading characters, one the independent owner operator and the other one the well-dressed responsible, you know, sleeping in his truck and the other one the well-dressed responsible guy with his uniform uh, <laughs> who's the teamster and and getting paid well. And so the teamster's barn and their world was very different from the world of George of uh, of uh, Humphrey Bogart, who's the rough guy, who's I'm on my own, I'm an American, I'm you know all that kind of stuff. And you see the clash of these cultures until, of course, uh, without giving away the story, uh, things get rough for Humphrey Bogart uh, as a result of the competition. And I will going back to our early conversation. Um, you can guess that the regulated sector is. George Raft sector, all dressed neatly oh, yeah. and, you know, responsible, and they're very safe. And the exempt sector, the regulatory exempt sector is where Humphrey Bogart is. <laughs> and he's, you know, fighting and scratching and dealing with crooks everywhere and you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's a, a terrible way to live. That's why, hence the title, they drive by night. So, um, you see some some great shots of going up the grapevine in that, as I recall, in that movie, the real grapevine, not the thing that there is now that's just this kind of weird super highway. Do you know the grapevine? What I'm talking about mm -hmm. the grapevine? I don't. Oh my. Okay. Well, I come from California, so the grapevine is is literally was a grapevine going up and over to Tehachapi from uh, Simi Valley, and uh, I think I've got my cities right, but that that was a brutal drive. the guys would be standing uh, there was no air conditioning and it's hot there even then before global warming and they'd be standing out on the running board with their truck in low low in granny granny gear yep. and they're standing on the running board you know talking to each other going at the same speed pretty much maybe twice the speed of russell's flying wagons up that mountain you know maybe three four five miles an hour until somebody got in the way. I've seen the same thing in China in, in the modern era. So I've seen the same version of what that looks like uh, brought to the to the present time. It's all a matter of, of economic development. Today, that highway is kind of a scary, fast super highway uh, going up through there. And it's a very strange thing for those of us who are old enough to remember the real grapevine. <laughs> but that world is the world in which this movie is set which is why every trucker should watch that movie we're going to stop right there with this episode like i said in the very beginning the second part of this we're going to air next week uh, so make sure and tune into that tyler what are you thinking so far yeah i mean it's just it's a lot to unpack in this it guy is, he, dude, he i don't awesome. know how he can retain all this information well he's a professor so cool. like this yeah. guy's got you know photographic memory i yeah. mean just to understand this and like there was nothing he even had to think about like he asked this question he just knew it off the back of his head yeah um from the beginning so i love this like i said if it, it, like being in the industry like it's like man we're getting back to the roots the, the, the beginners of trucking and the pioneers that started trucking and you're going to be just as excited for the second half. So don't miss that out um, next week. Make sure and subscribe to that um, before we close out of here. Hey, just a couple quick things. Um, we mentioned it before our insurance company, bulk insurance group, they are rocking and rolling. Um, I've said this before. We actually have landed some really strong contracts with some companies to give very affordable competitive coverage if you are in you know getting close to renewal or maybe it's coming up you know within the next six months or you're just interested in general reach out to us man you're not going to be disappointed i hate insurance i know you do too as well we have figured out a solution to make it better make it more affordable for you and make it a lot less easier and painful um, and we're that strong about it. So make sure, check out Bulk Insurance Group. You're not going to be disappointed. And again, tend to, uh, uh, tune in next week for the second half of our conversation with Michael. Yep. Thank you and God bless.